Ladies and gentlemen, as our keynote speaker, Mr Costello, highlighted, there are two major events that are affecting the, our, our society at the moment. That is climate change and, a, and an energy crisis. A broadening energy transition is taking place and nuclear power has a role to play in that. In fact, nuclear power is now entering a new renaissance period. The nuclear technology itself is also changing. Gone are the days of the 20th century, big, uh, large sort of nuclear power plants. What's now coming into the industry are small modular reactors, SMRs, that are quick to build and as efficient, if not more. They're cheaper and far more flexible. China and the UK, for example, are already pushing ahead with SMRs. And overnight, last night, France have committed to now increase their engineering technology as world leaders into building SMRs and using it for export by the years 2030. The new Japanese Prime Minister has also recently stated last week that they're looking to bring out the remaining mothboard nuclear power plants and restart those in Japan. Now, none of these factors have actually been counted for in the forecast for new, new demand and where's that uranium supply going to come from. And in the Australian uh, press of this week, it's been particularly exciting. In fact, outstanding. In the Australian Financial Review, following article headlines, we had nuclear power can help fill the gaps. BHP came out with Australia can't ignore nuclear in the race to achieve net carbon emissions. Uranium gets a boost from Japan's nuclear sea and hedge funds are now snapping up the uranium equities in a bet on green energy. So that global increased recognition of how nuclear power can play at decarbonising and mitigating climate change through reducing that carbon emissions while addressing the energy crisis is what's really driving the price of the uranium that we see. And that gap between demand and supply that has always existed is further exacerbating by the fact that the Sprott um, tr uh, Commodity Trust is now acquiring a lot of available mobile inventory and removing that from the market. And it's forcing, actually, nuclear power plants to change their method and go back to long-term contracting, which is where restarts projects such as Honeymoon comes into play. The only way the industry is going to get off its knees, as it has been for the last sort of five, ten years, is to encourage higher prices. New incentive price of up to 60 US per pound is required to bring new projects back online. However, Honeymoon, we've got a head start because this is a restart project. Boss Energy is the 100% owner of the Honeymoon Uranium Mine. We're located in South Australia. It is the premier uranium state within Australia. The only producing uranium mines are in South Australia where you have Olympic Dam and the Beverly Mine. The Beverly Mine is particularly interesting. It's located about 250 kilometres to our west. It uses exactly the same production process as what we use in citra recovery and iron exchange. And those two methods account for over 60% of the world's supply of current production. Honeymoon is going to be the third producer in that state, and by that, Australia's next producer and one of the first to come back on globally worldwide. What COVID has effectively taught our industry is that reliance on a small number of jurisdictions and reliance on a limited number of producers is a very unwise strategy. So what we're finding is engagement with utilities, they want to see new development and they look upon Australia as a globally stable, uh, geopolitically stable country which can supply uranium as it has been doing for the past 30 years. In fact, Australia actually supplies 10% of the world's demand, that 10% could power the whole national grid annually. Honeymoon is a pure play uranium mine. It's a brownfield asset, as mentioned, a restart asset that was producing uranium, exporting around the world before being placed into care and maintenance due to low uranium prices. Since we acquired the project in December 15, we really sought about to technically improve the mine such that we could increase the production profile and lower the operating cost to be more competitive in an environment that's in the doldrums. But where we are now with our all-in costs sub 32 US per pound, we're already seeing prices, spot prices today, 46.5 US per pound, term contracts in the low 40s. This mine could be cash flow positive right now. What we are doing is waiting for a sustainable market to emerge that we are comfortable entering the market into, which I'll walk you through right now. 
But really the key aspect that we had this year for, or a milestone that we accomplished was releasing our feasibility study in June of this year. It really was a successful study and it's the final technical study that we need, introducing iron exchange, lowering our costs to that 32 US per pound, cash costs of 18.5 US per pound. We've done the hard work, we're ready to get going. And in conjunction with these outstanding results, in March we raised $60 million to acquire 1.25 million pounds of uranium. We could see the environment changing in our industry. The reason why we did that is to give us a further competitive edge as a restart project to give utilities and fuel buyers confidence that, that we, the confidence that we can actually supply into offtake agreements during our ramp up period. What, and it's been a remarkable success. Already nine utilities have reached out immediately to, to say that's it. We are now sort of looked upon almost as if we are an existing producer. And being long in uranium, it's actually proved to be a wise commercial strategy as already that investment is 55% up or some $28 million. I'm pretty conservative by nature, um, and, but what I've, what I've been more interested in over the past few years is really proving uh, the technical aspects of the mine. But this year I adopted a different tack at the Diggers and Dealers Conference only two months ago, where I highlighted how good Honeymoon is and how well advanced we were to capitalise on this new market. On the back of that feasibility study, and certainly reading the writing of, on the war and seeing how the industry was moving, I explained in that conference only two months ago that when prices move, it can be sudden, violent and quick, and it was an opportunity not to miss. And boy, oh boy, has it ever. In the past two months, we've seen the, the spot price that was moving at around 30 US per pound shoot up to over 50 US per pound, grab, sort of floated back to 40, found a base level. Overnight last night, it's back to 46 and a half US per pound. Back in the industry in 2006-08, when I was involved, it, it, we saw dramatic increases. The spot price was rising by dollars a week. When this commodity moves, it moves quickly. And we're, we're almost going, entering into that same period. We feel we're at the start of the new period. And the way to sort of leverage into that is to offer market-related contracts that allow us to move with the market and lock in that higher price contract. Our method is to, as a restart project, really seize upon that first mover advantage. Not wait for all the future developers to come on stream, but really take advantage of that when we foresee a sustainable market. As I've mentioned in the ASX, we've had, I think, over three, three RFPs in the most recent weeks. Overnight, I received another one. The utilities are coming out to contract, which bodes very, very well for our, for our, for our industry. This graph is one of the wide, most widely um, uh, sort of highlighted graphs. The other aspect to highlight there is that term contracts typically um, command a premium of up to 20% on the spot price. It's term contracts that we'll be entering into. Tip it's, it's, uh, in the uranium market, the barriers to entry are far easier than the barriers to exit. Those term contracts are typically for minimum of three to a seven year period, which gives you the sustainability of the mine life. For us, we're only looking to contract about 40% of our mine life. At these prices, we could do that, keeping a lot of the spot material to get exposure to the upside. So I'm sure some of you remember how buoyant that market was, but we really do believe that we're at the cusp of this new re renaissance period. Uh, I think the other thing to highlight is do expect volatility. Currently, the spot commodity trust is really buying and soaking up a lot of inventory but new buys are needed, and that's what we're expecting with the utilities. But as they say by this graph, the longer the space, the, lo the longer the base prices, uh, the longer the space, and prices can go and have gone ballistic. Just talking a bit more on the market fundamentals, there's a real shift, a real transformational shift in the past six months, and they're there before you, but the key element here is that the fundamentals existed long before this change in global perception towards de uh, mitigating climate change. It existed long before COVID. The fundamentals were simply, with the, with the industry in the doldrums, there's been a lack of investment into building new mines. There's been no exploration taking place. It really has been a starved industry where, where utilities have been reliant on existing inventory levels. The big change that's occurred that's given that sharp increase to the spot price 
has been the emergent such as ourselves, junior uh, producers, acquiring physical inventory, foreseeing a price rise, the similar as we can see with the Sprott Commodity Trust. And since February, we've seen significant increase in investment into these uranium equities, some $2 billion, which is really changing the market. These develop developments signal awareness of a strengthening uranium market, and it's fair to say that the market is now moving not only on perception, but as well as demands. Those utilities are waking up. If you want to be serious about a sort of look at a project quite seriously and one that the fuel buyers are looking into, these are the key elements that we've learnt within the industry that really set aside projects and what we look for in terms of investing in a project. Honeymoon is a brownfield project that's previously produced and exported. It's a proven project that's known by fuel buyers and has gained the trust. It's in an industry very low capex to get back into production of only 80 million US. It's a tier one first world jurisdiction that's so very, very important in today's uh, economic climate and it's a destination as such for utilities to diversify their supply risk. It can be fast tracked to production. Within 12 months we can be back up and running post a final investment decision. And in fact we're narrowing down on that 12 month period, have already advancing our front end engineering or feed work. Uh, it's also a low cost producer, producing as mentioned, sub 32 US all in cost, cash costs of 18.5 US all in sustaining costs at around 25. But one of the key soft issues that's really important to highlight is that this is a fully permitted uh, mine in a very geopolitically sensitive commodity. It takes years, greenfield projects up to eight to 10 years to achieve that status. We're ready to go. In terms of financial highlights from the feasibility study, most important aspect to this, it only utilised half our jork resource, which is what resides on our current mining licence. We have the opportunity to grow this significantly more. Revenue of up to 1.28 billion over the life of mine, EBITDA margin of 62%, really healthy IRR percentage above 40%. We only look at projects with an MPV greater than at least two, two and a half times our, our um, capex, which we comfortably do. Quick bird's eye view on the plant. There to the right of the screen, production well fields. Those are the initial well fields that we'll be producing from. High grade, up to 1,200 ppm to account for the first two, three years of production, sitting just there adjacent to the plant. Where the production facility button is, their solvent extraction columns, they'll be replaced by the iron exchange columns. That's the fundamental difference of what we're bringing to this project and what our studies were over the past few years. It's got access to road, to rail, airstrip, we get our power off the grid. We're located only 80 kilometres northwest of Broken Hill, ready supply of labour and support. It really is a, 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 a plant that's in very good condition, has been kept in top care and maintenance since it went into shutdown. More recently we had the EPCM, in fact a few weeks ago, EPCM contractors on site just to have a look and, and the reports came back fantastic. The cells are energised, it's in really good, good nick. Um, looking at our resource, this is where we're going to grow further from here. So our strategy here is twofold. Twofold, sorry. The mining licence you can see in the, in the red square to the lower right of the screen, that's where that honeymoon licence sits. That's where 36 million pounds of jork resource sits. Outside of that mining licence is a further 36 million pounds that sits on two other satellite resources, one called Jason's, some 15 kilometres to our northwest of Honeymoon, and another called Gould's Dam to, to, the, to the west. Overall, we have a land package of 2,600 square kilometres. And over the past four years, we've done significant exploration work, geophysical work, assaying, assessment of previous historic drill results, geochem, aeromagnetics. We have defined over 16 drill-ready targets ready to go. And the rigs go in November to prove this resource up. We have an exploration target of up to 190 million pounds in addition to the already established 72 million pounds Jork resource. It's terribly exciting. We've just, I'm just about to announce in the coming week, weeks um, the, the, the outcome of the seismic uh, surveying that we've completed and really to show where we'll be drilling. But that's really the twofold strategy to further increase the life of mine and increase our production throughput. 
corporate overview, this is the team to take you forward. Peter O'Connor was the leading uh, non-exec on the Northern Star, involved their um, uh, company for nearly 10 years. Um, joined the company at the beginning of last year. Bryn Jones, career in the industry, 15 years with that mine to our west, the Beverly Mine. Um, previous COO to Laramide. Wyatt Buck, uh, general manager of MacArthur River um, for 15 years and the Key Lake, MacArthur River's Cameco's flagship mine. And then he went on to Paladin, where he's headhunted to lead their Langer Heinrich mine from construction to nameplate capacity. Very strong. And then the key management consultants that we've, we've recently taken on. Uh, not Sashi, who's been, I've had the pleasure of working with for 10 years. She's one of the world's top uranium traders, one of the top five heavily involved in the industry, 35 years, very well recognised. John O and Trevor Robinson. These really are very seasoned people uh, within the industry and perhaps one of the strongest operating teams you'll see on the ASX. In terms of our physical uranium, as mentioned, 69 million. We have 21 million in cash. We have no debt, no debt whatsoever. A very strong enterprise value. So really the various work streams I've, I've commented on in terms of how quickly we're progressing the feed work and the exploration side. But really a quick corporate summary of where we go. I mean, we have an export permit up to 3.3 million pounds at which we can, we can move quickly. We have the strategic inventory, the experience board, strong ESG credentials, and a clear pathway to generating significant cash flows. This project can deliver serious thematic financial upside when we get going. So I'm gonna go back to this slide and just highlight once again, that's where we were back in 2008 to 2012. Where's that price gonna go? I think, you know, we're, we're really excited. In fact, we're pumped because where are the proven projects? Where are the jurisdictions that they're lo located in? Where are the people that can actually operate these mines? Where is that supply going to come from? We are one of the pr few proven projects with proven production that can and huge exploration blue sky. And as it was in the case in the last cycle, you know, whether it's us or some other uranium producer, please don't miss the boat. Thank you.